so happy everyone is here and those of you who have joined us amazing hopefully new beginning after today's class uh just you know i always sometimes say now more than ever and i said that two years ago and four years ago but like really now more than ever <laughs> thank you sorry, sorry. it's okay we'll manage. so yeah we'll manage we'll manage one day at a time with uh, our love and relationships and more than manage please god get to that place of unity of thriving of uniting you know whether it's relationships in marriage whether it's the relationships with in-laws or children or our own family members of birth. Um, I hope today and I pray today what I share with you from my heart to your heart will really impact you in a way that you will not be the same. The information that I have studied over the years were so eye-awakening to the challenges of all relationships that I felt such a need to, even from a very young age, to like crack the code. Like it doesn't make sense why people who even bring children into the world, why people who choose to marry each other have such difficulty in their relationships. Why? How? And, and no matter how much I was searching, it didn't really help me until I again started studying the deep teachings of the Torah that explained the reason why the challenges are there on purpose by God's design so that the relationships would trigger us into working at refining ourselves. Uh, a very special image I like to give is like a, a glass vase and it looks beautiful and then or a pitcher <laughs> and then you put milk in that in that pitcher and all of a sudden you see a little trickling of cracks in the vase and 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 so the pitcher is you and the milk are the people around you and it's almost like it helps you see where are your weak points, where are you sensitive, where are you maybe not as empathetic or compassionate. And it actually helps you grow, helps you, you know, see the truth of what you're here on this earth to do. Tikkun Amidot. I actually was in uh, a, a Sheva Bracha and Rabbi Deitch from Kolal Tzemach Tzedek of Yerushalayim was saying that marriage, and relationships are for our tikkun of our midot. Because if we don't have any kind of connection to anybody, we won't know that we, you know, are a little too sensitive or a little too, uh, you know, defensive or maybe more angry than we thought we were. And, and it's the relationships that um, let us see what we need to work on. And really when when two people are together it's like two egos <laughs> unless they have really put the effort to draw down the divine wisdom of hashem's torah to be able to withstand the test of the differences the lababacher rebbe actually taught that the woman has a like a 300 almost 65 degree opposite side of the soul of the male counterpart and that they are not going to get along because they are different and that they're supposed to have this chaotic experience to some level because through the chaos as i said it ends up helping us see what we need to fix it also teaches us that how can you make a bracha of, you know, how can you like do even uh, the mitzvah of anything? Like for instance, if you have no mezuzah, like, you know, then you can have a mitzvah of putting on the mezuzah. So it's like you almost have to have uh, a bit of chaos and a bit of not getting along in order to be able to do the mitzvah of having shalom whether it's shalom ben adam lechavero, between one and the other, or shalom of shalom bayis, the shalom and the peace in your home. 
So many times people come to me and say, why are relationships so difficult? I can say, because two egos don't get along. And yes, before marriage, it's like Hashem has gifted uh, the person with extraordinary, you know, powers of their soul to be able to see the good in the other, to be able to experience the unity with the other. And once they get married, God basically takes that extra transcendent part of the soul away. And then two people are relating to each other in that ego way. And then it's very difficult to, to connect or to, to tolerate or let alone really love them. Uh, and you know, the Hebrew word to love is not found in any of the, you know, Kabbalistic teachings of the, of the ten spheres, which we're now during the, you know, 49 days of counting. Uh, there's chesed. Chesed is one of the foundations of all of the other spiritual energies. It's not called love. Chesed, by doing and giving to the other, going the extra mile, even though you feel like they don't deserve it, and even though you really feel almost like, like you almost can't because of what happened to you with that person. That is love. The ability, to, and that's a special kind of love. That's like a, a love that's the, a, of the highest order. To be able to be God-like and give and give again and be kind and extra uh, loving to someone who may be difficult to, to love. I mean, if, if it's... if. if you know, if everything's going your way with that person, it's easy to love. When it's not going your way and it's really challenging and you rise above the challenge and you still love. That has such a dynamo power. And there's so many stories, and I want to start with a few of them, to really understand, like, the power of love, even when you don't feel loving. The power of love by, by doing the acts of kindness, by forgiving, by, you know, rising above the situation and being the lamp lighter, as I also say, and, and to be the example to them of what is real love. You know, sometimes when people have challenges in their, in their relationships, I say, look, you know how children sometimes can have their bad days and most days, you know, they have those moments where they're, you know, naggy, crying. They can even have major tantrums, but you still feed them. You still bathe them. You still try to say the story before going to sleep. You still kiss them because you know they're children. So I tell people, you have to have that same mentality with everyone. You know they're human. You know their ego. You know it's the human condition. And it is what it is. And just like you have the internal power to turn it on, to love your children despite the fact that they're children and have those tantrums and behave a certain way, you have that power. It's a God-given gift of power that's in your soul. It's in the DNA of your soul. Some people say, well, but I didn't have a loving family and I never was loved and I never experienced what it really means to be loving. I come from this family, I come from that. And I'm like, true, it'll be a little more difficult, but it's not like you have to recreate yourself. The power of love is in you. And the power of love in you can more and more get unleashed as you follow the Torah directives of how to get there. So back to a person who recently got married, they're in cloud nine and they're feeling the love and the excitation and even maybe, you know, more than that. They're just like in, a, in like la la land. They're, they're just like taken away, like love sickness for one another. And then at that moment, it's like they got that gift of that transcendent part of their soul to see the good in the other. It's a type of wisdom that God blesses us. But then, after marriage, God takes it away on purpose. And two now egos have to interact with one another. And two in individuals have to like work now to get to that level on their own 
journeys, on their own efforts, on their own level of refining themselves to be able to tap into that soul power of their, theirs and to actualize it. So how do you tap into that power of love that's yours? In the DNA of your soul, that's in an inheritance from Avram and Yitzhak and Yaakov that gave us that power of love. So how? Well, you know, if something's very stuffed up, you can't add any more to it. You have, let's say, a, a, a glass of, <laughs> you know, wine that just went rancid and putrid and there's even like mold on top. Sorry for the ugly description, but there's no room for any fine wine in that. So you have to get rid of the dirty substance wash it, rinse it, shine it. And then what happens? You have room. So when, so for the fine wine. So when a person rinses as a, as it were, their soul, uh, you know, their, their animalistic soul, negative character traits like anger and sadness and, 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 uh, all kinds of negative attributes that they have, then they made room for themselves. There's room. And so then these transcendent soul powers that are ours finally get revealed. And when these amazing spiritual powers in our heart get revealed with this amazing transcendent wisdom, then we start to be able to see good. That's why there's a pasuk that says, Matza isha matza tov. And it says matza twice. Not the matzah we eat on Pesach, but matza in Hebrew also means uh, to find. Oh, you found a good woman? Did you find good? They would ask. So the first finding, God helps you find the good in the other. Then he takes it away. That power to see the good in the other, he takes it away. And so then the second matzah comes from your effort. Now you have to find the good in the other. And the only way you're really going to be able to have the power to be able to see the good in the other and to be able to love them is by understanding that you on your own won't get there. You need your soul powers to help you block and, and not see all the, the negative in the other. So um, there's an incredible teaching that, uh, that the Lubavitcher Cherebi said. And he said as follows that um, in, in this story, there was a man and he wanted to uh, marry off his daughter. He was uh, actually the king. And he made a contest of everyone that should actually, um, you know, make a beautiful portrait of himself. And the best portrait would be the winner to, 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 to marry his daughter. Well, one guy did a, a, an, a, an exact picture of the king. And the king didn't like it. He happened to be not so good looking. And so then the next artist said, well, I'm going to make a picture of someone uh, kind of high, like someone completely different. And then he'll like me. And, I'll t and the king said, that doesn't look like me. And he didn't win and b banished both of them out of the kingdom. He was so insulted. Finally, an artist came and he said, Here's my portrait. And what did he do? He made the king exactly the way the king was, but he did it in a way that it hid his negative flaws. So the king was hunchback. So he made the king like on a horse. So you couldn't really see his hunchback. He actually made um, the king leaning because he, he was club foot. One foot was shorter than the other. So you couldn't see that he had a club foot. He actually had many patches of scars on one of side of his face, but he only could see the side, and he had bulging eyes, but he squinted to, to do a, a position of as if he was going to, uh, uh, to, to go hunting, 
So you couldn't see all the flaws. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe said is that when you see the flaws in others, like you have to understand like um, how to like almost see them in a way that brings out their beauty and their like potential of what they can be and like almost hide the negative because those negative qualities actually are the positive of them. So, so that's why every day when we pray in our prayers and we say this, this prayer, Vahata, Kamocha, it's like the beginning is Hareni Mekabelai. I take upon myself every day to love another fellow Jew as oneself. Why do we say that every day? I mean, because we really need God's help. We really need God's help that, that we'll be able to love them like we love ourselves. We have flaws. And we're supposed to live with ourselves. They have flaws and they are not perfect. And so when you realize, I have to love myself as is, as we spoke in last class. So it gives me the strength and the power every day to remind myself that, that I have to love them also, even with their flaws. Just like I have to love myself with my own flaws. And if you notice that prayer, it comes after the... Um, the teachings of the of 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 Bilam. You know, remember when Bilam cursed the Jewish people? And 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 Hashem stopped him from cursing and it became a blessing. So right after that statement of please God help me, I take upon myself to love a fellow Jew as myself, that paragraph, Matovu Olecha, actually is the key ingredient of how to keep our love for the other. Remember the tents? All the tents were all over the place in the, in, in, the, in the desert. And Bilaam came out and started saying, oh, how beautiful these tents are the Jewish people. It was supposed to be a curse. God caused him to bless the people. So it teaches us what happened in the desert is what we need to do today. What did they do in the desert? What was so great about these tents? Each door was not aligned with one another. So that if when they opened up the tent, two doors, no one would see and look into someone else's tent for modesty reason. But modesty is also not looking at their imperfection, not looking at what's wrong with them. That's the only way I'm going to have the ability to love. If I'm constantly seeing the negative of them and I'm constantly looking at why they didn't do this and how come they didn't do that, then I won't have that ability to love. So when you happen to see, and if you peek and you see their negative, which is so often and so easy, right? Like, cause, like it's, cause we're opposites and it's like we see the world differently. Then I have to see their negative character traits as something very holy. As we talked about last week, uh, the last session that we had, if they're very angry, that means they're a very holy soul and they have extra fire and they're like ya Yaakov Avinu, uh, like Yitzhak Avinu, who has a lot of fire. It's just they don't know how to channel it. And if they're very uh, um, depressed type and lazy and very stubborn, then we have to see, oh my gosh, they're so holy. Like once that's channeled, that's, that's their greatest gift. And if they're so argumentative and always uh, arguing and they have such a fiery way of speaking with their words, then they have such a gift of speech. They're so holy. God gave them extra measure of this power of speech. And if they're very lustful and they're dealing with addictions, they're so holy. If you see their negative, you have to switch it in your mind. Cover up the negative and see the good that's really like, you know, supposed to surface down the road, just like what's supposed to surface in you down the road. That's why when, when Yitzchak was about to give a blessing for his son, and it was supposed to be for Esau, remember? And Yitzchak got dressed up. Uh, uh, Yaakov got dressed up and went in front of Yitzchak. And his mother said, 
put on the, the, the garments of Esau. Why? Why this trickery? Rivka knew that when Yitzhak was going to bless Yaakov, dressed up in the garments of Esau, and when, when Yitzhak was going to say, wow, I, gosh, it feels like Esau, but there's a call Yaakov that we should remember sometimes the ace of like behaviors on the outside is not who they really are. And when we take the time to be mindful at the moment, I might be hearing an ace of response. How clueless of them, how cold of them, how could they be so crass or whatever it is sometimes that we're seeing or impatient. We have to remember. Feels like an Asaph sometimes, but it's a call Yaakov. Inside is the Neshama. Inside is the Chelek Elokai Mamish. And that's why, again, when, when Yaakov approaches Rachel and weeps on her when he first meets, why? It was not just a, a, a moment of uh, like being so overwhelmed by whether, you know, her presence and her soul. It was also for the future generations. And because Rachel represents like the mother of all souls. And so when he cried, he wanted every one of us to tap into the power of compassion, the power of feeling for the other, even with tears that they're lost or that they're, they're buried, they're, they're so far away. And with that power, the power of our love for them, instead of taking it personally, instead of being reactive, instead of distancing and being colder than cold because of what they did or didn't do, we have the power to unleash their godly essence. And that's why when, 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 the waters that were after the Kriyat Yam Suf. Do you remember that story? And, and Moshe Rabbeinu was right at the water's edge and nothing was happening. There was an agreement for the water to split until Yosef Bones came in. Yosef Bones represents the idea of someone buried because he was buried in a coffin. And the Jewish people had reached such a low level of behavior in Mitzrayim that when the waters saw these people, they didn't recognize them as Jews. So Moshe Rabbeinu was saying, yes, the, the, on the outside of these people, they reached the 49th level of Tumah, but look, here's the casket of Yosef. Just like he's buried in that casket and you can't see him, but it's Yosef. And the bones, the Hebrew word for bones is etzem and etzem. That's a tamot, coming from the word essence, the etzem of the neshama. On the outside, it's a certain way, but their soul is buried. So when some people say something to you, going back to even to what we learned in Pesach, and you blunt the teeth of this wicked, he's not wicked. You have to soften, soften his sharp words to you sometimes. Seems like he's biting you. You have to blunt it. Know that he's in pain. Know that it's not who he really is. Behave to him or her as one would a princess or a prince. Because they're royalty. They're a neshama. Just recently I heard an incredible explanation of something between Rachel and Leah. I was so blown away. My Rebbitzin from Yerushalayim was visiting. She stayed by us. And then she was delayed by us because of some accident from some of the members of her, one of the members of their family. So we got extra time together. And what did she say about Rachel? Rachel actually is our mother, our foremother. Everything that she did paved the way for us. You know, when they got married, when, when, um, Leah and Rachel were like in this really 
incredibly like challenging like moment in time because Leah thought she was going to marry y Yaakov and Rachel felt really bad so she decided to give Leah some signs so that when they were about to get married that they weren't going to um, know that it was Leah and to protect and, 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 and not shame her, her sister because she was the older one and it's the custom that the older one should get married first. But Rachel was the one that Yaakov kept coming to him, uh, 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 coming to her and like uh, teaching her the, the, the teachings of the Torah. So what happened was she protected Leah. But wait a minute, the story, you may know this, but look at the story now, even in a deeper level, will help you so much in your love and relationships. She was teaching her the signs of all the Torah mitzvahs, of being a Jewish woman. At the time, Lavan kept getting the presents that Yaakov wanted to give to Rachel, but gave it to Leah. Leah didn't know. Leah didn't know that he, Yaakov, was going to marry Rachel. She preserved her dignity. And if you see in the Chumash, it says, at the time when she wanted to get the, the, uh, the, you know, the fertility herbs that her son uh, was giving her, and, and Rachel says, can I please have these fertility? You have so many children. I don't have any. Please, can, we, can I have it? I'll, I'll, I'll do anything almost. We'll switch nights. Guess what happened? What did, what did Leah say? What? You took my husband and now you want my son's gifts of these dudanim? What kind of sentence is that to tell Rachel when she gave her the secret so that they'll, they'll be married first? Why? Because she didn't know. Rachel kept her mouth shut from the beginning. She didn't know that the presents were given to her from, from, uh, from Yaakov that was really supposed to be hers. She didn't give her signs to say, you know, I'm supposed to be the one. I'm going to give you signs. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. You're not going to know. I don't want to make you feel belittled and shamed that, that I'm the chosen one and you're not. She kept her mouth shut. And guess what happened? What happened after that? She still kept her mouth shut. She was accused of thievery almost. You stole my husband seven days after my marriage. And now you want my dudanim? You want my herbs for fertility? Racha kept her mouth shut. One of the main secret ingredients to a successful marriage is to keep your mouth shut. Especially when you're flaring, especially when you're hurt, especially when you're distraught, especially when you really don't get it and it's under your skin like that you have to right now. The word for pe is the word in the gematria of chesed and ahava. If you're going to use your mouth and you're going to speak, it has to come from a place of love and kindness. Then your power of love is unleashed. And then their power of love is unleashed. Rabbi Ginsburg talks about circumcising your mouth. Where does he get that from? Brit Mila. Mila is a word. Circumcise the amount of words you say, you'll have more peace. The wording is not from nowhere. It teaches us. We know a famous sentence in the Tehillim, in silence righteousness do speak. In silence. Be silent for a minute. Calm down. Take a deep breath like we said last time. Ground yourself. 
think things through. Is it worth me opening up my mouth right now? And then it's going to just be something I'll regret and put, you know, so much toxicity in an already kind of toxic situation. Rachel did it again and again to preserve the relationship between her and her sister. Rachel, Rachel, my dear mother, my dear foreign mother, gave me the gift of that power. Because this is what happens when you do do that, by the way. Because, look, our words really don't matter in some ways. The negative words. We're talking and talking and trying to convince and trying to preach and trying to, you know, cajole and all these different things. And, and many times it's like pointing a finger at someone and they just don't like it. They feel more repelled. They feel, no, they don't want to connect to you in any way, whether it's your child, whether it's your spouse or other people in your life. Instead, let go, let God. There's a teaching that when you actually move away from a situation because before you might have been aggressive domineering you know all in the name of god you know for a really holy purpose and whatever but you're so all over the place there's no room for the shechina in your home you think you're going to solve it on your own this way and that way and forcing it just like you can't force a birth of a baby and you can't force a birth of a of a, of a butterfly if you force someone to be where they should be for, you know, right now, then, right, the butterfly can't learn how to fly. So when we let go and we, and we step back and we listen, because silent has the word for listen, if you rearrange the words. Listen to what they're going through. Listen to what their pain is. Blunt their teeth of what they're saying. Then... Guess what? The Shechina rests in the home. The Shechina rests in your home. And what does that mean? Do you know another word for Shechina, as Rabbi Ginsburg teaches from the Gemara? Esh ochelet esh. A holy fire that now is in your home because you aren't so aggressive and you're not battling the wars of Hashem with the all kinds of interesting ways that are not so peaceful, to say the least. Then the holy fire eats up, ochelet, the unholy fire of the other. So the more compassion, the more feelings of peace, and the more respect, and the more love, and the more everything like that, what happens? The Shechina rests in your home. And it, the Shechina, will eat up the unholy fire of the other. Okay, I know it's not going to take a day or two. Trust me, children are 22 and 23 and you're still waiting and praying and, you know, like it's all, you know, interesting. Like you're waiting for yourself, you're 50, you're 55. It's still like you haven't gotten exactly where you want to be, Right? But little by little, the power of your love for them by keeping quiet and being loving gets the Shechina to do the dirty work. Gets Hashem to do the dirty work and do the eating up of the other's negative traits. And if you look at the word Ish and Isha, Ish has the Yud in it and Isha has the He in it. And both of them make Hashem's name if there's peace and love between them. Ish has the power of or sikhli. He has a certain type of wisdom. He has 10 powers of those wisdoms, but it's very undeveloped. It's like a little yud. The Isha has the he. She has five faculties of wisdom of her own, it's different, opposite than than her husband, she only has five. She's missing five, but she has five solid ones. So what is needed? The Shekhinah. What is needed to make each other 
meld into one another and get from each other's soul powers, the woman's missing five. The man is, has ten, but they're not developed. I would say, right, the, uh, the seed of a, uh, of a man goes into a woman and she develops his seed physically. She helps develop the soul seed of her man. But she's also missing something and needs the power of her other half. They're both half. So when they learn Torah together, when they are kind to one another, when they respect one another, when the Shrina is in their home, not only does it eat up the unholy fire, but it melds the two together. The fire of a man who's missing something and the fire of the woman who's missing something now gets to be melded into one and each one gets each other's power. And if you notice the story, I like to tell these stories because, you know, we read the Parsha and like there's, you don't, you don't really read the depth of what's going on. And one of the stories is after the splitting of the sea and uh, no, uh, right before the splitting of the sea and Miriam, Tikach et Atupin, she took the, and, and it says she was the Achot, her, the sister of Aaron. Praising her prophecy that she took the tambourines way before the miracle happened because she was a prophetess. And it says the sister of Aaron. So Rashi says, why say just Aaron, right? Aaron and Moshe. And what does this have to do with anything? Why? So Rashi says, well, because she was a prophetess before Moshe was born. True and yes. But again, the deep teachings of the Torah teaches something. And that is that before Moshe was born, even though Aaron was older than, uh, younger than um, Miriam, she honored him like a big brother. She respected him like a big brother, even though he was younger. And then the Lubavitcher Rebbe teaches what happened because of that. Her powers of prophecy came out because she respected her younger brother as if he was an older. Not only that, the powers of Aaron, his soul powers came out by her respecting him, by her loving him. Not only that, but, but whatever was Aaron's became hers. Remember, you're, you're melding. The other person's power becomes your power. You unleash their power. You unleash your own power that you were gifted and born with. So you're doing someone a favor by respecting them and honoring them, you think? No. You're empowering their godly essence to come out. Like Aaron. Rodef Shalom. That wouldn't have come out had she not honored him and respected him and loved him. Her powers wouldn't have come out. And even some of her own powers that, that, that became hers weren't even her own. It was his. Respecting and loving brings out the power of their soul. Another story. A story that also I was almost shaking when I heard this story. I was like, crying like I can cry now like when I read this many stories and this is a story of the Holocaust survivor Rizel and he was Baruch Hashem you know he's so famous he we had a museum and books and he's such an amazing person did so much good out of all his misery and traumas and he and he tells a story that he you know when he was escaping he actually dropped off his his um watch and put it under the ground and buried it in the backyard because he didn't know how long he was going to be gone, but he didn't want it So, because it was his cherished watch that his mother gave him as a gift. 
And years he wanted to go back. And years he wanted to see if that buried watch was still there because that was his last connection to his mother. And he did go back one day. And he did go and unbury that watch. And it was there, lo and behold. But shockingly, he couldn't barely touch it for a minute and right away buried it and walked away. It's like he was, couldn't and didn't want anything to do with the tragedy. He didn't want any memory of what was in a way. Although he longed for it and wanted it for so many years. And when I read that story, for some reason, I just kept thinking, oh my gosh. Every day we almost have to bury the moment before to be able to love and to be able to forgive and to be able to like move on because it's so easy. What was can really drag you down and be connected to negativity that just gets in the way of pure love. Love is giving. And the highest order of love is when you give when you don't feel like giving. The highest order of love and all your soul power is when you force yourself almost against your seemingly nature at the moment because it's really not your nature. Your nature is to love and to be God love. That's how you're more God-like when you, when you were able to love someone even in a difficult situation. That's how you unleash their power. As the Tanya teaches, your face is looking in a beautiful lake and you see the reflection back. And if you're smiling, guess what? You get a smile back. That's how you love another person. Smile at them. Love them. Then you'll get more out of them that they're going to love you back. Not as a, oh, that's the way to... Because that's what you're here on this earth for. Not to get love. To give love. God's one Ness, you know, we all, God is one. God, what is his oneness? Love. To love to give no matter what. To love. And, and, and to, to, to deconstruct almost the Yetzirah's animal soul's power on you to, to want to receive. That's the mission. That's the tikkun we have to do. We have to get away from loving to receive. Ashlag, the book on the, uh, the, the working of uh, our heart, says that's what we have to do, to follow God's oneness. His oneness is kindness. And to get away from the, the pleasure of receiving, to, to really ignite the, the pleasure of giving, the pleasure of love by the actions that we do. When we rise above, and again, that has such a power. And we talked a little about this the last time we were together. Like so many times, people like you know, in the name of God, really, you know, uh, you know, passionately, passionately, you know, do things that are really opposite of attraction and really repel people. Even they think they have every right to because in the name of God. Well, one of the stories that I read in the Chumash that changed my life from that day on, that was my goal to like really learn a lesson from this story. And that is the story of Reuven and Tamar and Yehuda. And these are the characters and this is what happened. Tamar was supposed to marry... Yehuda's third son, because two of them died in the marriage. Yehuda didn't want to give him the third son, because he's like, I don't want my third son to die in your hands. And Tamar actually wo- dressed up like a harlot to like sneak Yehuda to want to be with her. And very interesting, it's a very sketchy story. But you know who Mashiach comes from? Yehuda. Now, Reuven, that's a whole different story. Reuven, there, there's a scenario that happened with him and, and his father. Leah passes uh, on to the matriarch because Rachel passed away. She gets like the, the noble new position. Her whole life, she was second to, to Rachel. 
And that night, when, when, when Reuben saw that Yaakov's bed was with, Le, Le, with um, Rachel's maidservant, Reuben got really upset. And he rashly went into the bedroom, moved the beds, all in the name of the honor of his mother, who, who, who for years was like, was a second woman. And now, after Rachel passes away, Rachel's maidservant is next? He was, he was so pained for his mother that he acted very aggressively and with rash, and, and, and he loses it all. Kahuna had to come from him, he lost it. Malchus of Mashiach had to come through him, he lost it. And he lost all his inheritance. And it was now Yehuda that got the dynasty. What? Yehuda? Sees a foxy woman on the road, has this an interesting uh, 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 affair, and, and a, a baby is born. And yet he has Malchus, and, and Reuben had such a pain in his heart for his mother and wanted to do something about it, and he loses everything? What the? That's, that's not that fair. So the deep teachings of the Torah, that Labavar Cherebi said, that it's the last deed that counts. Meaning, you might have a good feeling of something. Oh, I want to honor God, and I want to protect God. And I, but then you shame someone, and you act aggressively, and you fight, and you argue in the name of God. The end result was, there was no shalom. And you disrespected someone, and you shamed someone. The end result, even though it came from such a good place, done, over. Person who sinned even, and did something even very sketchy, in fact, well, the Mepharshim say he had such a passion that no study could overcome because the union had to happen in this funky way. But what was the last deed that he did that got him that schus of Mashiach seed from him? He stood up. He said, I don't care that I'm like a big shot in the community. I don't care now that I'm gonna be shamed forever. I don't want this woman to die because it's my fault. I should have given her my third son. He stood up there and said, she's right, those things are mine and don't kill her. That saved the baby's life and it saved her life. That was the end result of all that sketchiness. He stood up. He did the right thing, and that's what counts. How many times in our relationships? We think we know better, and even if we did know better, but we end up doing things in a way that's just so off target of where the initial sensation, that was the whole thing of Lagba Omer. They didn't respect one another. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe actually said it's not because, oh, they didn't respect one another that they got punished. They didn't get punished. They didn't accrue the merits and the protection that they would have accrued had they respected one another. And that would have protected them from the plague that was going on around them. So again, we go back to the power of love for yourself. Can you imagine? Tzedaka tatzil mi mavet. You act kind is also a form of charity. Charity is not just money. Charity is sharing wisdom. Char is, is respect and honor. That's a kindness you're giving to someone that maybe they don't even deserve. And you accrue this amazing protection, like a, like a chain of armor. And it protects them because you unleash their powers to grow and grow and grow. So many stories. You know, it happened to me. And sometimes I like, I don't know, I say, should I share this? Should I not share this? But it makes such a point. When I told you like it changed my life forever, still working on it, but it was like an end goal and an understanding of like, don't fight for Kedusha. Like, it's not worth it, not in a way that's going to be disrespectful to other people. So my husband was very into guns, <laughs> still is. 
you know, for protection and we got to protect ourselves. Uh, and we were living in Israel and I um, finally had the miracle baby that for almost eight years we weren't blessed with children. And now came the time that, you know, everyone around the world, uh, you know, they let their children play with guns, especially in Israel. You see guns everywhere. Army, our kids might go to the army. So like, yeah, let them get used to the guns. And I was like, no, no, I was held at gunpoint twice in my life. My sister was held, you know, took a, uh, they stole her car. Like, oh my gosh, guns. And we actually had an incident in Malay Dominion when people showed it into my, uh, like we, have, we were, the gears, we didn't fix it. It was like a hole in the window from the gunshots. Like, no, I don't want my children to play. And, I, and, and my husband would say, yes, yes. And I would argue with him in front of the children. I would say, no, no. And all in the name of wanting to protect my children not to play with guns. But it was wrong. It was disrespectful. It was sh shaming him. Like, I know better. I'm the... I'm still, uh, don't we do that sometimes? Right? So I learned this and I'm like, oh, I'm really doing this wrong. This is not right. It's the opposite of anything that would be kosher and holy to do for sure. And then I had an idea. Let me call the rabbi and see what Chabad rabbi, you know, says about what guns are about and can kids play with it and what does the Rebbe say about that? And I remember, like, I'm hearing his words now and he's saying, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm hearing it. The Rebbe didn't even let children drink Purim to play with guns or dress up with guns. Not even Purim. I said, wow. Case closed. I mean, my husband's a lawyer. I'm like, no, I don't have to argue. I just have to go and tell him. You know, I talked to the rabbi and he said, the rabbi, you know, said, kids don't play with guns. And that was it. No more. We have to be wise. We have to know how to, like, massage the situation. We have to, like, know how to. And when we're trying to, like, you know, help our loved ones see the light and see the truth. And, but not in a way that's disrespectful, not in a way that's hurtful, demeaning. It's unbelievable how the changes take place when you do that, like, mind shift. Like, it's not me that's going to help them by my words and my this and my that. Yes, by kind words, by loving words, by being the example, by, by you know, being more listening and more hearing where they're at, you know. And sometimes people say to me, but okay, children are children, but they're adults, you know. She, she's an adult. It's one thing children, you know, they don't have a brain so developed, you know. Uh, their brains are, you know, very physically small. And, and even the Tanya talks about it. Only till the bar and bar mitzvah do they have even the Yetzir Tov. They're all Yetzir before then. Okay, so then you, 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 get, you muster up the strength. They're an adult. They should know better. No. They don't necessarily know better. Just like you have your moments and you don't necessarily act and behave exactly like you want. And they too. So we see that our neshama really is yearning and so desirous to have the Shrina always with us, to always have peace, to always have love. But the more we don't desire it for the wrong reason, the more we'll have strength not to be triggered by everyone else around us. If you're so desperate that they're going to respect you and love you and it's going to so upset you that they didn't because you're putting such a big price tag on that love and you throw that price tag away and you say, I'm not here to get love. I didn't leave Gan Eden and the, this holiest of holiest places up in Shemaim. I had everything. I didn't come here for that. I'm here for a mission, to be godlike, to give love. 
then I'm not so needy of them, not so desperate for their attention and for if they didn't give me the attention and, and I free myself from this enslavement of wanting any worldly thing of this world, including love, including respect, including honor. And you let go of that. You really let go. And you have the Geula mindset. You know, the Rebbe said, open your eyes. The Geula is here. You can see. Rabbi Jacobson said, like beautifully, he said, open your eyes and see the good in the other. That's Geula. Open your eyes to the truth of the human condition. Open your eyes to letting go of, like, like you know, when you see children, like, oh, they want the lollipop, or that's a bigger piece of cake. You're like, okay, it's a lollipop. Right? We see, our mind understands it's not worth being so upset over. But in reality, if we were up in Shemaim, everything is like a lollipop. If we really understood the things that we so desire from the people around us and then we don't get it, it breaks us. Whether it's so many relationships, night and day, I'm hearing it. And trust me, we're human, it hurts. We have every right to hurt. You know, they say that, that even though we have our rights, but we're not here for our rights. We have to switch our mindsets to be less human and more godly and less dictated by our animalistic desires for the things of the human condition that we want. When we free ourselves from that, we're really going to make a, a, a definition of a sort that's going to be different now. Because when you are so needy of this and love and respect from the other, it's basically you're using them in a really weird way to make you feel good about you. You're not in the relationship because you need them to make you feel good about you. That's a self-serving relationship. That's not, not a love relationship. Oh, but I want it for him or for her. That they, they shouldn't behave that way because I care. Like that. Okay. You want it for yourself too. But it, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. And if you're that upset because it's for them, then you realize it's really maybe not for them. <laughs> because... In, in reality, it, 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 when there's anger, oh, you really want it for them, and then you spew out anger to them, and you shame them, it's really for them? Do you see what I'm saying? There's, there's a, a nuance here that you could catch yourself. That if it's really for them, make them, don't break them. If it's really for them, love them. If it's really for them, Pray for them instead of ruminating in your head how could they, how should they, and whatever, all those things. You might say to me, it's a tall order, but any other way of living without this kind of tall order mentality? <sighs> every corner, every around the corner, it's just, it's, it, 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 you become enslaved by what people give you and what people don't give you. This is true freedom. You're here for a mission. You're here to be godlike and be a giver. You're here to be less human <laughs> down the road, hopefully. More human than human. Wow. I hope these words coming from my heart and to your heart, I really hope like that you felt the freedom and that you made the connection of how good it feels when you can rise above, be the example of what you can do with the power of love.
take a moment and really like desire the Shekhinah in your home. The desire of the Shekhinah to bring unity, melding. The desire of the Shekhinah to do the dirty work. And you can be peaceful, you can be soft, you can be loving, you can be kind and understanding and compassionate. You could judge favorably. And the whole world begins to love you. And not because you want that love, because you are the example of what it means to love. And that's the most exciting feeling. It's the biggest pleasure that God gets because you were a walking example of what you were meant to be on this earth, more and more loving. So, maybe take a moment. I wanna just close your eyes, really let all what you learned soaked in. Take that deep breath. And almost like sense like so much now has melted away from your heart. This knowledge was very, this, 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 what you now gain, this knowledge is like, it's a, an eye-opening aha moment of like, how are you gonna free yourself? And remember, we need to nourish our soul we need to daily do our prayers, daily do our meditations, and daily learn Torah in this precise way to nourish ourselves so we can be less human and more angelic and more loving. So see yourself like so nourished spiritually now that you gained what you were taught here. And now feel fortified, feel strengthened. Your heart is strong. Your heart is now brave. Your heart is courageous to face the challenges of the day-to-day -day love and relationships in your life. See an image of yourself so different. Lips so ready to say sweet things. Eyes full of compassion as you're entering the space of the other, wherever they are. And see the vision of yourself capable of listening, capable of being grounded, slow to speak, slow to react, and in fact, just really being present for them. See now your love, heart bursting with this fire, a fiery love full of compassion of the challenges that the people around you may be going through. There's an aura of such softness in every part of you. And then there's like this light, the Shekhinah you see is in your space this incredible, holy, fiery light. And it's just bringing light to so many people around you. There's now a pull. There's now a way to have them feel more comfortable with you in your space. They're softening up. You constantly are hearing Hakol Yaakov. You're constantly around them, sensing the essence, the etzim of their neshama. You're having the power to blunt their harsh statements. You have the power not to get sucked into their energies because now they're actually transforming before your very eyes. Now they are walking in your ways. Wow. 
now the light is shining ever brighter the unity the bonding the sensation of peace it's like a dream and you say a little prayer please Hashem may this vision of the unity the love just please help me continue this special special sensation of love please engrave it in my brain let me recall this image at will whenever I need to let me not forget the power of love And so everyone is so beautifully united here. And all of you are walking out of this amazing vision. You start to feel the body, the body that really, really wants to behave in this way, to have this self-mastery, to be able to shine your soul powers of love. And then you feel the feet giving you the strength to walk forward. You feel the calmness of your heart, but the strength of your heart to really rise above and face the day. You feel your soft lips, the ones that are going to be smiling way more now, and the kind eyes feeling for the other. And Hashem is answering Amen to all of your prayers. Take a hachata right now. Do what you can to bring Mashiach by using the power of your love. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm looking for questions. Ah, I'm touched, thank you. I don't know if there's any questions here. I think I can go to the chat um you can find me at reaching new no yournewheights.com are more of my love and marriage classes i have marriage books marriage workbooks i have a mikvah book and i have other books on on that website as well um I'm looking for the chat here i uh, also um invite you to be on one of my chats i have a few um we're doing the sphere accounting everyone who wants to be added please let me know and i have a general chat that uh, announces my classes and uploads the youtubes of the class you might have missed you'll get that on whatsapp uh, it's really beautiful to be here incredible nessa for everything you're doing because so many people are telling me Many shuls don't do classes as much anymore. It's just since COVID, you know, and since internet and Zoom, and like people aren't meeting people and people aren't going out. It's just much easier to stay home, I know, and at least be on Zoom. And thank you for God creating Zoom and Facebook and all these different things. But uh, it's nice that we're not giving up here and we're getting together in person. And may Hashem bless this amazing place to continue and doing such holy work. Uh, and, and, and including me in, in this uh, endeavor to, you know, get together one way or the other because <laughs> we got to get together uh, and we got to share and we got to learn together, really. Um, thank you. So, wow. Blessings, everyone. Any questions from the audience? Um, I mean, 
let me tell you, w without going further, many women come to me, and if you look at my client testimonials in my marriage book and other books, none of the men came to, to counseling. It was only the woman, and it wasn't the woman's fault, honestly. I mean, there were a lot of things, but through them accepting and loving them, and even cleansing their mind, because a lot of people might behave properly and right, but inside they're like festering with hate or judgment or looking down at them or disgusted. And, and this repels other people. Rabbi Label Wolf once gave a class on how, which comes from Tanya, our thoughts create, I think we talked about this in the last class, our thoughts create like either energies to connect or energies to like uh, repel. So when we have a lot of bad thoughts in our mind about them and we look down at them and we think that they're, you know, then they pick up, it's, it's scientific as well, by the way, but they really pick up the, 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 the energy of our thoughts because our negative thoughts create negative angels. And then their angels, because we all have angels hovering around us. That's what the vibe is. We're picking up on their negative angels that were created by their negative thoughts. And so then they're repelled by you and they don't want to listen to you and they don't want to connect to you and then they're colder to you and then they're more distant. So we also need to refine the way we think about them internally so that they won't be repelled. Tall order, <laughs> we have a big gate Sahara. But remember last week, the more we fill our mind with positivity, the more we imagine ourselves getting together. Imagine ourselves getting along. Imagine how godly they are. Imagine how they are and what they would be if their, their negative fire, water, air, and earth was transformed and, and channeled properly. And the more we envision the good and think good about them and bless them instead of do the, what normally people do when they are upset with someone that is so cold and distant. It made a difference. Even the men never went to the therapy or never did any kind of counseling. And it was the woman who did all the work and she transformed their relationship. I mean, there's so many non-Jewish people preaching this. It's crazy. Like, I don't know, there's a book called, I don't know, The Proper Care and Feeding of Husbands. And there's this other book. And like how, like, you know, do your part even though they're not doing theirs and you'll see good results. And it's the same thing with your children. You do the same thing. Do your part. If you start, uh, start treating your children uh, like they deserve to be treated because they're so chutzpah maniac, as they say, you're not going to get anywhere with them. It's just going to get worse and worse. And they're just going to be more bitter and more resentful and more uh, toxic. So I hope this gives you a lot of hope. No matter what stage you are in. I mean, I have women that came to me at 55 and even 60. That for how many years it was so challenging for them. And within a short period of time, things turned around when they were able to do this. And again, how do you have the power to love another? You need the high of your neshama. How do you get the high of your neshama back into your life? By getting rid of anger, sadness, and anxiety, and judgment, and blah, blah, blah. And how do you do that? By prayer, meditative prayer, which we discussed in detail last class, and learning Torah. And some people will say, well, so many of my uh, friends, uh, and they're t telling me all their stories. Uh, not me, I'm just like, like their husbands are this, and they go pray three times a day, and they learn. But are they doing meditative prayer? Or are they spitting out words? Are they doing the learning of Hasidus? Let me tell you, since you're still here and you're not like, you know, like, I'll just tell you, I learned this from uh, Rabbi Rashab of uh, Etz HaChaim. He said, the sin of Adam was not that he ate from the tree of good and evil. The, 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 the sin was he didn't eat from the tree of life, which uh, represents Hasidus represents the Pnimiuta Torah, the inner essence of Torah. Had he partake of the tree of life, he would have been able to withstand the test of the temptation of the tree. So if we, on our own, build ourselves up in this way, spiritually nourish ourselves, well, our body needs to be nourished, otherwise it's weak. Our soul needs to be nourished in this precise way. Then we have the power to rise above and clean all this schmutz of our animalistic negative character traits 
that we're here to do, by the way, then we can have the Chaya, because we have space. We're not as angry. We're not as judgmental. Then this transcendent part of our soul has a place to be within us. And then you have the power, because now you have the wisdom to be able to see the good in them and love them. Well, first of all, all my books is all the Hasidus. It teaches us the the, the deep secrets of, of how to transform, and uh, and so. But and then, and it's a little more user friendly than some of the real like you know high level deep teachings of the Torah like Kabbalah. It it brings it down in a more practical way that you can like more understand, and you know for your day to day life. But and then you'll go and buy Tanya of the day, or you'll go and buy other, you know, deep teachings of the Rebbe's Sichas. So much is written, uh, uh, you know, now in English as well, that you can access these teachings and have a more Geuladic day, because you're like really getting this tree of life, giving you the, the, the strength to withstand the Yitzhahara. My dear soul sisters, and, and, and uh, wow, may we continue learning together. May we t continue inspiring one another. Trust me, when I, when I say what I say, I'm saying it to myself ten times fold so that I could actually more and more live what I say. <laughs> Please, God. All right, thank you. And Oh, we'll be back again. Soon we're going to do that health class uh, at next month's gathering. So I'm so excited about that. Look uh, out for the poster and the flyers uh, uh, to uh, let you know. And that also, hopefully, life changing information that will change your life. Please, God. Do you have a tape of tonight? So it's recorded on Facebook Live. Usually it takes like a couple of days to get it on YouTube. And then once I add you to my WhatsApp group, I, I post. Uh, the class that I did. Actually, this week, uh, Shabbos, I'm doing two classes, so I'll keep you posted uh, for two different classes on Shabbos, so I hope some of you can come. Early yeah, one in the morning and one in the uh, Rosh Chodesh year. Oh, I don't know. I think it's 11, yeah. Okay. okay, so you're welcome. Hope we'll see each other more in person as well. Yes. Yes. Facebook, you become my friend, or if not, it's public, so you can go for it there too. And sorry, the angle was wrong, but my uh, thing, whatever, <laughs> broke. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 Mashiach, Techo Mamish, with love, 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 love. That was.